Psalm. Psalm chapter number 8. Psalm chapter number 8 tonight. We're going to start there and then we're going to be looking at some, something else. We're going to start in Psalm chapter number 8. Verse number 1 starts and says, O Lord our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who hast set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou hast made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I pray that you'd be with me as I uh, bring forth the word of God here, and I pray that you'd help us all to understand uh, what it is saying and how it can apply to us. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Many people, when they think about the Bible, think about it as a boring old book. Now, a lot of these are unbelievers, people who just have no idea what the Bible has to say. Some of them have never read the Bible at all. Some of them have only read it just a little bit here and there, and they kind of just think of it as somewhere where there's just there's genealogies, and there's just this, this high level of theology that's just just kind of beyond the average person is really difficult to understand. But we as believers realize that the Word of God is inspired, preserved, and it's, it's true. It's, a, it's an accurate account. Everything that we can read in it is an accurate account of things that actually happen, things that are true, things that are real, um, things that are just as real as you and I standing and sitting here today. And it's it should be fascinating to us. It should be something that we're just enthralled with. And when you read enough of the Word of God and you're coming at it from the proper perspective of a believer, it is that. It can't help but be that um, to us today. Uh, we know that every amazing event actually happened and is recorded not just as some nice account, some nice story, but it's there to actually teach us something, that we can actually learn something and get something back from it. Um, makes it very different than any other book that we could look at. And what I want to look at today, the part of the Bible I want to look at, is in Job. Um, so we don't have time to go through the whole account of Job and read all the verses that there, there's a whole lot there that we can go through. So I'm just going to zip through the basic timeline of Job. So Job was a fairly wealthy man. He had a lot of stuff. He had a lot of children. And God goes, or Satan and God are meeting, and God says, have you considered my servant Job? Look at him. He's doing good. He's, he's obeying me. He's honoring God. And Satan says, yeah, that's just because of all the stuff he gave. And so God says, okay, take away his stuff. Take away things from him. So Satan takes away all his wealth, everything he owned, and all of his children die. And the Bible says in Job chapter 1, verse 22, in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Job didn't sin. It didn't change how Job uh, behaved toward God. And so, 
God asked Satan again, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, well, it's because you wouldn't let me touch his body. It's because he wasn't in any pain. He was, he, he's physically okay. And God says, okay, you can touch his body, just don't kill him. And so Satan does and gives him boils and sores and uh, he's in a lot of pain. And the Bible says in Job 2, verse 10, the end of the verse, it says, In all this did not Job sin with his lips. He even had his wife saying, you should curse God and die, but he didn't. He did not sin with his lips. He maintained his integrity before God. And then Job's friends all come and essentially they tell him something along the lines of, you must be a sinner, you must have done wrong, God is just, he wouldn't be doing this to you if you hadn't done something wrong against God, you deserve this. Those types of things uh, were being told to Job. And of course he had his own responses and the back and forth and whatnot. But I want to get to what happens after where God begins to speak and he briefly addresses Job's friends, but most of the time he's addressing Job, and he gives him a whole series of rhetorical questions. Questions that answer themselves in the question. The, the answer is an obvious answer um, that anyone, that should be apparent to anyone reading them. So, the Bible isn't a science book. It's not scientifically exhaustive. So if we want to know about plants and find out you know, how a plant grows from a seed and what things are necessary for it to grow and what conditions are profitable to it and what are not profitable to it, and those types of things, we're not going to be able to read it like a science book. So it's not scientifically exhaustive, but it is scientifically consistent. So anything it says about science is true. Anything it says about science is completely accurate. So we can see that in this book of Job, even though it is one of the oldest books of the Bible. Um, possibly the first book written in the Bible. So if you'd like to turn, you can turn to Job, chapter number 38, and I'm going to start in verse number 4, which says, Job 38, and verse number 4, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, or who shut up the sea with the doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? When I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and the thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. So these verses clearly speak of God's creative powers, the creation of the world that God made to happen. And in this passage, God likens it to people building a building and setting the foundation of the building, setting the cornerstone of the building, so, if you think about the creation of the universe, what would the foundations of that be? What would be the cornerstone of the universe? What would be those things that would be fundamental in building up a universe out of nothing? Well, there's lots of things that come to my mind, but 
One of them is the existence of time. God actually created a bound, a start, an end. So you could say, in the beginning, God created the beginning. Because before that, there was just God, and God is infinite. He has no beginning. He has no ending. So there was no bound at all. So God had to create a bound, and then there was a bound for him to have created a bound within the bound. It's kind of <laughs> begins to bog your mind when you try to think about time without time. Um, so let's just move on. The existence of space. So when I say space, I'm not talking about uh, the expanse of the heavens, the stars, and whatnot. I'm talking about the dimensions that we have, length, width, height. Those didn't exist. Those weren't concepts. God created them. Um, we, we have words that we use to describe these, but God created the existence of them. There was no such thing as, as space necessarily. The electromagnetic spectrum is something else that comes to mind. So we have this broad spectrum. Uh, we think of it most and we use most the visible light portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. But that's only about one nineteenth of the entire electromagnetic spectrum, which consists of gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet rays, infrared rays, microwaves, and radio waves. All of which we use on some level for some purpose, or at least we know about. Um, happening. Um, many of them are very useful to us in our uh, modern day society. But the electromagnetic spectrum, I mean, God, God came up with that. He built the capacity for those, that thing to exist. So we do things that use it. You know, we turn on a light or we, you know, use a microwave or different things like that. We use those things, but God created the capacity for those things to exist. Uh, the elements, with all their different properties, but composed of the same subatomic particles. So you have this table of elements, and all the elements, they have different properties. You know, some are heavier than others, some are stronger than others, tighter, you know, different elasticity, different... Uh, breaking points, boiling points, and yet they're composed of all the same subatomic particles. God thought of that. He, he thought, okay, here, we can take these building blocks, and look, we can make a whole bunch of other stuff that looks totally unlike those building blocks, but um, provides a, a variety and um, something interesting in our world that makes up our universe. And then I think of the fundamental interactions, or the fundamental forces. Um, they're called fundamental forces because uh, as humans in the scientific community, they have found no way to reduce these to lesser, fewer forces. So those are gravitation, electromagnetism, and both the strong and weak nuclear interactions. These are fundamental forces that make up our world that God created, that God created out of nothing. And these, of course, are just a few of the foundational things that God created that make up our universe. So, Job is being asked, and we in turn are being asked, can you do that? And of course, we can't. The, the rhetorical question is, of course we can't. Only God can do that. So what else can God do? Job 38, verse 17 says, Have the gates of death been opened unto thee? Or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? For all the advances that we have in science and medicine, we are still nowhere near the pre-flood lifespan of humans. So, before the flood, people lived for 800 years, and it was common that they lived that long. So, we, as much as we can extend life, can't even seem to get up to 200 years. But, before the flood, when man was there, 
God had them much later than that. Um, God controls death. It, he, uh, it is in, not within our ability to extend it much at all, let alone what God can do and give us eternal life. Job 38, verse 19 says, Where is the way that light dwelleth? Where is the way where light dwelleth? And as for darkness, where is the place thereof? That thou shouldest take it to the bound thereof, and that thou shouldest know the paths to the house thereof. Knowest thou it because thou wast then born, or because the number of thy days is great? Again, this is an example of another very scientific description of light. Light is something that's in transit from a source to a destination. Yes, it's traveling very fast, 186,000 miles per second, but it is still in transit. So when it says, uh, where is the way where light dwelleth? It's telling us light isn't something that is here, dwelling here, or here, dwelling here, it's, it's in a way. There is a way from the source to the destination. It's the way of light. And then where is the place of darkness? Well, darkness, since it's not something in transit, there are places of darkness, but there's not dwellings of the darkness. It's just absence of of the way of light. So very scientific and obviously something that only God can do. Job 38, verse 22. Hast thou entered into, into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? By the way is the light parted which has scattered the east wind upon the earth. Who hath divided a water course for the overflowing of waters, or a way for the lightning of thunder, to cause it to rain on the earth where no man is, on the wilderness wherein there is no man? And so if anyone ever asks you that theoretical question of if a tree falls, in the woods and no one's there to hear it, does it really make a sound? The answer, according to this verse, is yes. Or at least, if the rain falls where no man is, in the wilderness where no man is, it's still there. To satisfy the desolate and waste ground, and to cause the bud of the tender herb to spring forth. Hath the rain a father? Or who hath begotten the drops of dew? Out of whose womb came the ice and the hoary frost of heaven? Who hath gendered it? The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. So these are obviously all weather-related things that only God can do. And man can only affect these things on a very, very, very small level. You know, we cool our homes with air conditioning, we heat our homes, um, or at least those up north heat their homes. <laughs> but, uh, and, and this is actually very applicable to what we're in right now. So Hurricane Irma, I'm sure you've all heard of it, and you've all heard tons of information about it. You know, you turn on the TV or the radio, or you know, you look at the websites, and they spew mountains of information about it. And you know that they've even whittled that down. Uh, they can give you temperature readings and wind speeds in all sorts of places all over the earth. And they got models and they got diagrams and they got, you know, this thing and this. And they do these computer models and all this stuff. They know a lot about the storm. But if you asked anyone, how much can you move the storm? How much can you, like, divert the course of it? Not just detect the diversion of the course, but actually make an impact on it to put it somewhere else. Of course we can. That's something only God can do. 
And so all these weather-related things um, are things that only God can do. Job 38, verse 31. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season, or canst thou guide Arturus with his sons? Knowest thou the ordinance of, ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? Taken as a set, these verses uh, seem to be talking about the seasons for which uh, these constellations are harbingers of. So the Pleiades is brightest in the spring. Um, oh, Orion is bright, brightest in the winter. Uh, Maseroth uh, seems to refer to all of the constellations in the sky which give an indication of the time of the year, the seasons of the year. And Arcturus is a uh, very bright star that also gives us an indication of when things are, the times and the seasons. So essentially, you could say Job is being asked here, can you control the seasons? Can you control the movement of the earth? And of course, the rhetorical answer is, of course cannot do these things. Only God can do these things. But when you look at these on a scientific level, you actually there's actually a whole lot more here to what's going on in these descriptions. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if Job didn't understand it on this level as well. And that is, the Pleiades is a very small cluster of stars. So... It's not just one star, it's a small cluster of stars, and they're all in close proximity. They have a, um, and because of their close proximity, their gravitational effects on each other are very strong. Gravitation gets weaker over a distance, it's stronger when it's near, and these bodies are very close together, and so their gravitational attraction is very strong. So, when it says, the, the cluster is composed of about 250 stars, and they act as a group, they move as a group because of their strong gravitational attraction to each other. So, when it says, can you bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades, it's talking about, can you keep them gravitationally together? Is that something that you had a part in making these great bodies and giving them the strong gravitational attraction to each other? Of course not. Of course not. Orion's band, or belt, is made up of two bright stars and one star cluster. So um, to us it looks like three stars, but it's actually two stars and one star cluster. So. Um, when they look at the movement of these things, and they advance it over time, they find that the two stars will eventually, to our point of view, converge so that to us they look like one star. And then the star cluster is moving off in another direction, and so it's kind of drifting, drifting away. So when God says, can you loose the bands of Orion, this this belt, this three star, what appears to be three stars in a row, can you loosen that? And well, God can, and He is loosening it. It is actually happening right now. It's very s slow to our perception and our time frame, but God is doing this. And so, when God asks Job, "Can you do this?" Well, of course not. Job, of course not. Can't do that. Arcturus was once thought to be one star, but was later, and, and it is one star, um, but it was later found to have 52 other stars that are within its vicinity. So they call this the Arcturus stream. And in the verse it says, Canst thou guide Arcturus 
with his sons. So the sons of Arcturus would be these other stars that are in the Arcturus stream. Interesting that God knew about that before we did. So stars are all in movement, are generally all in movement. So our sun is in movement at 12.5 miles per second. That's across our um, galaxy. Newton gives the velocity of a star that is under control to be not more than 25 miles a second. So Arcturus is going 257 miles per second. So it is considered a star out of control. And what this does is it weakens the ability of any other gravitational force to do something to change the direction of Arcturus. So when God says, canst thou guide Arcturus? He's not just talking about any old star that's going at 12.5 miles per second through the galaxy. No, he's talking about one that's going considerably faster, that is out of control. Can you guide this one? It's, it's really a, a poignant thing that I think Joe probably got. He was, uh, I'm sure, a lot smarter than most of us are today. Only God has the power to guide them. And there's a lot of other things we could cover in this passage. And um, There's more about weather. There's uh, the lion, the raven, the wild goats, the wild ass, the unicorn, the peacock, the ostrich. There's a section about the horse, the hawk, the eagle. But after after God presents these things, Job has the right response to what God has presented to him. And Job says in Job chapter 40, verse 3, Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. Behold, I am vile. Job recognizes, I'm nothing. I'm vile in comparison to who God is. Now, God is the one that told us how just Job was, how right before God Job was. But when Job is confronted with who God is, he still recognizes the fact that he is vile. So if Job being that good he still considers himself to be vile. How much more should we consider ourselves the same? But God doesn't stop there. And he goes on, he gives them some more examples to help him understand who God is. And I'm just going to cover two more of them tonight. Job chapter 40, 40 verse 15 says, Behold now Behemoth, which I made with thee. He made behemoth with man. He eateth grass as an ox. Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is chief in the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring him forth food, where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees, and the covert of the reed and fens. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a and hasteneth not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. 
He taketh it with his eyes, his nose pierceth through snares. So the word behemoth means beast, so that doesn't really help us understand what behemoth is. Some Bibles have a note in them, not part of the, the Word of God itself, but a note that someone added to go with the Bible that says that this is an elephant or a hippopotamus. So, when you look at the description though, bones like strong brass and iron, he drinketh up a river, his nose pierceth through with snares, he has a tail like a cedar, strength in his loins. These are these aren't features that these aren't all features that we think of when we think of the elephant and the hippopotamus. And you'll note that none of the really unique features about an elephant or a hippopotamus are listed in that list. Um, we don't find out about the ears or the trunk of the elephant. We don't talk about the way the hippopotamus is in the water most of the time. But what we do see, um, one thing in particular very much sticks out, and that is behemoth has a tail like a cedar. So when you think of an elephant's tail, or you think of a hippopotamus tail, you don't think of a cedar. And if you do, maybe you should take another look at what those animals look like. So, if this isn't a hippopotamus or an elephant, well, some people would say, oh, well, this is just a mythical creature. This is just something that was made up. Well, that would kind of destroy the whole point of God's argument here. God says, God is saying, it, it would be like God was saying, can you make this mythical beast that doesn't exist? Mm -hmm. Well, of course I can. I have an imagination. God gave me an imagination. Of course I can make a mythical beast. I can make all sorts of mythical beasts. It, it has no point. It doesn't mean anything. But if it's a real beast, which it very much appears to be and is, then God has a point. Can you do this? No. Of course I can't. I can't create a beast like that. I can't. Because it is more than imagination. It is something real. So, from the fossil evidence we have, this was probably a sauropod. Sauropods have long necks, long tails, four thick pillar-like legs. These include uh, Brachiosaurus, Apatosaurus, Brontosaurus, and others that I didn't want to have to pronounce. <laughs> they have, um, they are the largest known land animals, and one has been found that would have weighed 65 tons and would have been about 85 feet long. His tail was nearly 30 feet long. It sounds more like a cedar to me. Uh, they actually named that one Dreadnoughtus, and they examining the uh, fossil evidence, they believe that he was still growing, that this was a juvenile, and he would have grown even larger than this had he not died, probably in the flood. So, Job, it says at the start of that passage, that I made this behemoth with thee. So, Job was there when behemoth was alive. He saw this creature. He heard it thunder as it walked. He, maybe from a distance, could look up and see how tall, how big this creature was. So, it would have been something a whole lot easier for him to relate to than, well, guiding our tourists with his sons, you know, that's way out in the stars. And yeah, I can kind of understand that conceptually. But this was a beast that could have been right before him, and he could just stand in awe of only God can do this. So the last one I want to look at, the last thing I want to look at, is in Job chapter 41. And it actually takes up the whole chapter. 
which says, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put a hook into his nose, or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? This is almost like a joking, like, <laughs> will he make a covenant with thee? I mean, it's almost like God is laughing about this, like, like, really? Really? Of course not. These are just so over-the-top rhetorical questions that God is asking Job here. Wilt thou play with him as a bird, or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? Shall the, shall the champions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons, or his head with fish spears? So this was obviously a very tough, very powerful sort of beast, Leviathan. Lay thine hands upon him. Remember the battle. Do, do no more. So, remember when you tried to fight this beast and lost, or when other people tried to fight this beast and lost? Remember the battle and do no more. Don't try that. It doesn't work. Better not mess with this guy. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? Who hath perverted me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is, the whole, is under the whole, heaven is mine. I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely portion. Who can discover the face of his garment? Or who can come to him with his double bridle? think you're going to tame this beast? Do you think you're going to have any power to control what he does or where he goes? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride, shut up together as with a close seal. One is so near to the other that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together. They cannot be sundered. By his kneesings a light doth shine, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth goeth burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. And you say, why? Well, no, they're just making this up. Because this sounds like this Leviathan can breathe fire. Well, a couple things. Electric eels can emit 300 to 365 volts of electricity underwater. Now, if you didn't know that an electric eel existed, and was a real creature, would you imagine that there would be an animal that could emit 300 volts of electricity underwater? Probably not. You'd probably say, wow, that's a mythical creature. That can't exist. There's no way. Most animals, from cows to crows, lots of animals, burp methane gas. So, They've already got it. They've got the fuel for a fire. And um, the gas is produced by plant eaters. And so Leviathan being a very large animal, the description of him, he could have been a plant eater and could have consumed large quantities of plant material, which would have produced large quantities of methane gas. So once you have the fuel, all you need is something to ignite it. And there's lots of different ways that could have happened. So there could be a mechanical means, such as um, he smashes his teeth together and two teeth hit 
hitting against each other in some way, like a, a flint and hitting a rock um, would light a fire. Probably not, but possible. Um, it could have been something electrical, like the eel. Um, that would have been a possibility. Or it could have been um, chemical, like the firefly. And that's probably what it was. It was probably some sort of chemical reaction that would have lit the flame um, that this leviathan had. All easily within the realm of what we know exists today. So just because we don't know, we weren't, we don't have this creature present with us today, doesn't mean it didn't exist. Um, it's in the Word of God, so we know it does. The uh, the bombardier beetle uses a chemical reaction to produce a boiling hot tax, toxic gas, and is seen to deliver it in bursts up to 500 times per second. So we know of a creature that produces little tiny mini explosions, so producing flame doesn't seem that difficult. The passage goes on and says, In his neck remaineth strength, and sorrow is turned into joy before him. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm, firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone, yea, as a heart, as a piece of the nether millstone. When he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breakings they purify themselves. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold. The spear, the dart, nor the haberdown. He esteemeth iron as straw, and brass as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp, a point, pointing things upon the mire. Essentially, he's armored and impenetrable. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot. He maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Upon earth there is not like his like, who is made without fear. He beholdeth all things. He is king over all the children of pride. So it says he maketh the deep to boil like a pot. So it seems that he could start the fire even underwater. So, based on the abundant description we have here, this clearly appears to be what we would probably call a dragon. Now, not a dragon of myth, not a dragon of what people imagine for dragons. There's no little wings here. It doesn't fly. Um, but it is a real creature that really did exist called Leviathan. Um, the word dragon is actually used 34 times in the Bible. Not all to refer to Leviathan, but certainly sometimes it was um, quite an incredible creature that God created. Probably a plesiosaur. Um, they fit to the description. They had large heads. They're not actually classified as dinosaurs, but they are extinct. They had flippers, not legs. It goes with the description of being in water. Um, an amazing testament to God's creative powers. So... God, God gives all this to Job again, and Job, the second time, has the right response and the response that we should have. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel with all knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. Things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Here's his conclusion in verse 6 of chapter 42. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust 
and ashes. So, Job's response the second time is similar to his first. In the first, he said, I am vile. And in the second, he says, I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. So, when we get a proper view, a proper perspective of who God is, that should be our response. I am vile, I abhor myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I do thank you for all these fascinating things that you gave us to learn about in your word and to use to teach us about who you are. Help us to have a proper perspective of who you are and then in turn to have the proper perspective of who we are as vile, as undeserving of the grace that you bestowed upon us. I pray that you help us to remember these things and I ask in Jesus' name.